John Talley here with Boats.net. Today I'm going to walk you through building a lower unit for our 2004 F-225 and we're going to do it from scratch. So I'm going to walk through every single thing you need to check as far as your shimming and then checking the backlash to get this thing put back together and back on the water. So let's head over to the table, look at all the parts and the tools we're going to be using to get this project done. As you can tell from this table, my parts list is really extensive. What I'm about to do, it wouldn't make sense for you to do if you had as much damage as uh, the unit. You would just call us and replace it, get a whole new Yamaha unit ready to go, and you just bolt it back to your power head. What I'm going to show you is the shimming process that would be required if you were just replacing your lower unit housing and putting in all your original equipment. I mean, that happens very often. You break off a skeg, you don't want to trust a weld. Let's go ahead and replace just the housing itself. Conversely, if you were just replacing just one of your bearings or just one of your gears, you would still need to go through the shimming process and that's what I'm going to walk you through. So we've looked at all the parts, let's look at the special tools that you're going to need to get this done. Now any common hand tools that you're going to have, I'm not going to call those out. I will tell you what size it is as we go along, but the specialty tools I've got laid out on the table right now and let's go through it. The one specialty Yamaha tool that you're going to need is this. Now it is required so you can get a starting point for your shims for the Ford and reverse gears. Also, you're going to need a feeler gauge so you can take those measurements. Next, you're going to need a puller. It doesn't have to be an extreme one. It just needs to be one that can put pressure on your output shaft housing. Next, you're going to need to pick up a caliper. Also, we'll get a bearing driver set. Next, you're going to need a torque wrench that can at least go to 103 foot-pounds. Beyond that, you're going to need a slide hammer puller. Make sure that the jaws can be oriented in 180 degrees and they can get down to roughly an inch diameter. Last but not least, you're going to need a magnetic base depth gauge. It doesn't have to be a digital one like this, but it just needs to measure the difference from a calibrated zero. It makes it a lot easier with an articulated arm and a magnetic base. You'll see that later. So with what you see on this table is how I'm going to pull this off. There is one special tool that Yamaha makes that I'm not going to use. It is actually a unit that gives you a beginning shim size for the pinion gear. Now this one tool is north of $500. And if you're like me, I don't want to spend $500 if I'm going to rebuild the lower unit. It's, it just wouldn't make sense to do so. So we're going to do this without that tool. Now do I have access to that one? Yeah, I do. But what's the point? I'm going to show you how to do it in your own garage with just these tools. So now that we've got all our parts and our tools together, let's head over there and get started. So step number one with this process, let's go over to either your new housing or your existing housing and up under where the, uh, the trim tab would be there are a set of numbers that we're after. And you're gonna see an F for forward, an R for reverse, and then a P for pinion. And then there's gonna be a plus or a minus followed by a number. What that is, is a deviation from the exact perfect zero that they've measured on this particular housing. So we wanna write down these three numbers. F in my case is gonna be plus zero six, reverse is plus zero six, and P is plus zero one. Now those are going to be our deviation numbers. You're actually going, uh, they're going to be in millimeters, so you're going to divide them by 100 to get the, the number in millimeters. So that'd be 0 0.06, 0 0.06, 0 0.01. What we're going to use to do this is a flat surface, the flattest you can find, because the more accurate you are here, the less chances there's going to be you're going to have to go back and change out the shims when we actually measure the backlash. So, what we're going to be after is the forward gear taper bearing. and We want to face it up like this. See how they're tapered in? Now what we're looking for to put into our final equation is that distance right inside of here. Now the thickest gauge I have is actually 0.889 millimeters. So if that fits through there too easily, we may have to sandwich in a thinner one until we get at that particular distance here. So let's try the 0.889 and hold this just as flat as you can. 
just a light touch because we don't want it rocking back and forth. We want it flat against the, the granite. All right, that goes through there, but just barely. I'm not quite moving the bearing surface, and that's what I'm kind of looking for. When it starts to move just a tick, that tells me that I'm there. So balance that again. Let's bring over a point zero five one and see if that slides through together. All right, those both go through and it's still not moving. Let's bump it up. Let's go ahead and go up to a point one millimeters and see if that starts to catch. All right, see how that's starting to move my bearing a little bit, holding it flat. That's just barely moving it, so I think we've got a winner there. To get the M0 to fill into the equation down below, we're going to take 0.55 and we're going to take that 0.06 in millimeters, and that's going to come out to 0.44 millimeters. So that's our M0 number. So we've got our 0.99 minus 0.44, so that leaves us 0.55 millimeters and that's what we want our shims to be so we're going to end up at least having two of them in there out of our available shim thicknesses we don't have a 0.55 so we're going to have to add two of them together so what we're going to do is take both a 0.4 and a 0.15 those together 0.55 so we're getting ready to drive these in we're going to put in our shims first then we're going to drive this in and we're going to use a taper bearing driver to get that done. Whatever driver you're using, make sure it does have this edge and also make sure it's out of aluminum because we do not want a steel one to damage the surface. Is that surface right there? That's your bearing surface. We do not want to mar that. Get our shims down into position all the way down at the very front. Now we can take our outer race. Let's see if we can drive it in. Uh huh. That was a noise we were waiting for. That's the sound of success. She should be bottomed now. I bet you it is. That's all the way down. So next we're going to set up for the forward bearing and the trick here is to find a spacer or an insert that's going to catch it just on the inner part of the race because that's what we need to push against. You don't want to push against the actual carrier that's holding all the, uh, the needle surfaces. So we're going to face that down, get our gear in place and using the same driver we used earlier, push all that together. That should do. All right, guys, before we can measure for the shim thickness, we need to go and install the prop shaft main bearing. Let's just choose the correct driver, and we want to make sure it has contact with the outer part of the bearing. The other thing you need to note is the markings it has for where it was manufactured and possibly the part number. We want those to actually face in. That should do. Let's go over to the table and take that measurement. It's basically the same as we did for the forward. This time we're actually flipping the tool upside down and we're wanting to measure this M. And even on the largest one I have, which is back at that 0 0.889, it's still not nearly big enough to fill that gap. So we're gonna end up sandwiching them together until we can uh, get this measurement. getting really close. All right, it's starting to rub. I, th I think we can call that one right there. So our deviation from the housing itself was 0.44 millimeters. So we measured the M using our gauge at 1.6 millimeters. So 
T2 is going to be M minus M0, which is 1.6 minus 0.44, which gives us 1.16 millimeters. So to get there, we're going to go with 2.5 millimeters, and then we're going to add in a 0.15. Now that we know the shims for the forward and reverse, we can go ahead and start to put things back together because we're not going to use that $500 tool to determine the shims for the pinion. We're actually just going to pick one in the middle and determine if we're high or low. And hopefully our forward and reverse will be equal distance or off as far as whether we need to lift the pinion gear up or if we need to drop it down. Because what you're basically looking at here is this is your forward gear. This is the pinion gear coming down and this is the reverse gear. Those are the three variables we're having to line up right there. So as long as we know this is right and we know this is right, then we can just adjust this one up or down till we get the correct backlash. That is what we're after. Now that we've chosen the two sets of shims that can be determined, we can go ahead and start putting it together and see where we end up on the backlash and then adjust the pinion from there. Sounds easy, right? Well. Let's keep going. So we've got our shims, get them in place. We've got our housing, and we're actually gonna be pressing against this surface and not the very bottom. Now we're using a driver that just fits on top of these dog gears. That should do. Let's push her in. That should do. I'm not super thrilled about doing it this way. I really should have driven in that needle bearing before I put on this gear. But we are where we are. So what we're gonna use, is just a block of wood so we don't scar any of the surface because that's extremely important that it uh, not get damaged. What we're gonna do is use just a 27 millimeter socket. What I'm actually gonna do is spin it around backwards with an extension. That way I can help keep it squared as we're driving it in. Also, they want you to have the, uh, the markings, where it says Japan and NSK, facing out. So let's drop that into place. Get in our socket. Let's see if we can drive this in to go in until she bottoms. That's it. Don't push it anymore because that's a really thin wall and we don't want to damage it. There we go. All right, now we can continue. As soon as you take out this cardboard piece, all these little needle bearings are invariably going to fall out. So what I usually do is take a little bit of light grease, go around the casing, and then reinstall them, which I'm doing now. Because otherwise, when we go to put this in, they're going to fall out. With that grease in place, we can actually remove this. We have less of a chance of the needles actually falling out. So we are going to use just a length of threaded rod, three bolts, a couple of washers, and a socket to pull this thing in place. So this piece is gonna go up top, and down below, we're going to bring it up into position with just a socket and a bolt that's gonna be going through it, through the thread rod, and the whole section is gonna bring it, uh, pull it up. You'll notice on the outer casing, it has lettering, and they want that facing down. So the way we're gonna tackle this with all these different moving pieces, we're gonna rotate this up, that way we'll have gravity helping us instead of hindering us. So bring it up. Thing looks lined up. Let's see if we can get it to, to pull in. Looks like it's going straight. Yep. 
If you hit a bunch of resistance right from the beginning, that means it's not going in straight. So back off, drop it back out, and try again. This is looking pretty promising. We're just going to bring it up until it stops. You don't have to force it any further. Should be getting close now. There it is. Snug it down. She is set. Now, even with that grease, I still did have one or two needle bearings fall out. I'm just going to go fish them out, pop them back in. No problem. Just be mindful of that as we're putting this together. If you hear a tink in the bottom, <laughs> that means you probably lost one and you're going to need to extract it and get it back in there until we get that uh, input shaft put in there, which will hold everything in place. So next, we're going to install our drive shaft, the input shaft specifically, but here's the real trick. We do not have, and we're not going to use, that $500 special tool that measures the distance in between in here and here. More specifically, the variation caused by the manufacturing process of the shaft. Now we know that the housing itself for the pinion has just a plus one variance. So that means that it's really, really close. So the big question is, we're gonna take a shot in the dark as to which one is gonna be the correct thickness. I'm gonna kinda of head toward the lower end because I wanna actually be able to put the unit together. So when we do that and we measure the backlash, that will tell me, providing that the distance on the reverse and the forward gears is equally out, That'll tell me the distance that this one needs to either go up or come back down to where I'll have everything in alignment. So, with all that being said, let's go ahead and assemble it. So, you've got your bearing. Spacer. Our shim to be determined, and then our housing. Now if you need help putting together this housing, we actually did that in a separate video. So reference it and it'll tell you and show you the depth that the bearing and then the seals are supposed to be pressed into this. So before we get our input shaft in place, let's go ahead and get that forward gear in. So let's go ahead and lower in our input shaft, but don't let it go all the way down. Because we need to go ahead and get our pinion gear on along with its washer and nut. Our washer and our bolt, just put it on hand tight, then we'll come back and bring the housing down. As you're tightening down the upper housing, just be leery. There may be some play. You want to make sure that there is play as we're bringing it down. That'll tell us if that front shim, or the forward shim, is actually within the ballpark. It should be. Let's go ahead and grab the adapter, and then we're going to torque it down to, I believe it's 103 foot-pounds. There she is. Woohoo! So next up, we need to get the output shaft put together or the prop shaft put together. But before I do that, I have to put together the shift assembly. So all of these springs and washers and clips go on uh, this little shift assembly which actually goes up into the shifter and acts as a detent with these two ball bearings that's gonna allow it actually to shift back and forth. Complicated little uh, device. I feel like I'm building a watch. There we go. Now these two shift plungers, they actually face each other with the beveled edges pointing to each other. Then our spring. Then this washer and then this other piece goes on. So if we can actually get this to go in together without sending it flying around the room, I'll be impressed.
There we go. Fun. <laughs> we can take this assembly, drop it in here. Now, what you need to do actually is line up these two beveled areas with these two holes, because that's where the ball bearings are going to go. Those are placed into here, into the shaft, and the actual shifter slides on to here. And now, push the entire assembly in, and then rotate it so that is visible through here. Now we can take the clutch dog and get it in place. Make sure that F is going toward the front. Now you can put your pin through. Now you can take your cross pin spring, if you want to call it that, and wind it around. and that will hold your pin in place. There we go. Let's go ahead and get our seals and our new prop shaft housing. And these both go in back to back like this. And we're gonna set them right at five millimeters deep. Now, if you need specific instructions on how to do this, we actually did this in an earlier video. If you want to check that out, I can walk you through the process step by step. You don't have to get carried away right here. It's just to help get it in there. And one day, somebody will actually be pulling this apart probably replace the seals, so we want to make it a, as easy for them as possible. More than likely, we'll be the first ones to pull it back out. So we've got a prop shaft housing ready to go. Let's go ahead and get our output shaft in place. Don't forget this washer. A little bit more grease just on this running surface. Let's go ahead and get it in place. There we go. Now we can get our prop shaft housing in. My initial feeling so far is we're loose, kind of expected it to be, but that's okay. That means I'm gonna be able to take a measurement and that's gonna tell me how many more shims we're gonna need. But before we do that, I've gotta build up the shift shaft, get it installed, then we'll set it up and take a measurement. So we've got our seal popped in, got our shift shaft ready to go, just putting a little bit of grease on its pivot points. Got on our clip, our spring. All right, let's go get it installed. Now, let's see if we can drop her in there. That should be it. Uh, when you're putting this in, don't forget this little washer back here. Otherwise, you have a, I'm not going to pick up your water like you're supposed to. It'll leak. Get in our three bolts, then we'll be ready to check it. Now 
going to get this plate. Then we're going to bring over a, a dial indicator with a little tab that we're going to mount to the input shaft. And that's going to give us a measurement as to whether how tight or loose we are for both the forward and reverse. And the way we're going to do this is either apply pressure pulling out or pushing in on the output shaft and that will give us a zero tolerance where we can me measure whatever gap that there is for the forward and reverse. So to recap, what we have on the forward gear is a shim count of 0.55 millimeters. On the reverse, we have 1.15 millimeters. And for the pinion gear, just shooting out of the, out of the gate, we have a 0.4 millimeter. So to measure the forward, what we want to do is put pressure pushing the output shaft into the forward gear. To do that, we're going to use our puller and we're just going to tighten it up until the point that it can't be rotated. We're going to set up our gauge. Then we're going to flip it upside down and then get that little bit of lash reading. Hopefully there is one and everything's not set too tight. I don't think that it is. All right. Bring it back. Zero it. The range we were looking for was point two one to point four four millimeters. So we're just a little bit loose on the forward. So now let's set up, measure the reverse, and see where we ended up. So now we're going to measure the reverse gear backlash. And to do that, we're going to apply the opposite pressure to the out output shaft itself. Right now, we're pushing in on it. What we're going to do is take a propeller, not install that forward spacer. That way it will actually be pulling out on the output shaft itself. And that way we can measure that shim thickness and see if it needs to be adjusted. So the hope here is that the, the measurement will end up being loose as well. That way we'll only have to adjust the pinion to get it to come down a little bit and give us the necessary clearance. Now if it's too tight, uh, then I'm going to have to rework all of this. But hopefully they're both loose, this can come down, and that'll get it into spec. So you take the prop, you do not put the spacer in at this point. You actually take your spacer, instead of having it on the back side, you put it on the front side here, along with the washer. And then we're going to tighten it down until she holds still. That should do it. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're after. Now let's flip it around. One point five two. So yeah, she's definitely loose. Okay, so using the equation for the forward gear what we're going to do is calculate the change we're going to make on the pinion instead. Now he's going to show the equation on the, uh, on the screen. It's going to be m minus 0.33 and then you're going to multiply that times the 0.71. So we got the 0.53 minus 0.33 equals 0.2 times the 0.71. So we need to adjust it by 0.14 millimeters. So the new shim stack is going to be 0.54, or as close as we can get to it, 0.55. That's what we're going to actually go for. We're going to pull it back apart. We're going to change out those pinion shims to a 0.54, or as close as I can get to it. We're going to go recheck the forward, make sure we're still within where, where we want to be, and then we're going to do the reverse, see where it ends up, and then adjust accordingly to those shims. A little bit of a drawn out process, but I'm going to get you there. So here we are. We've got a 0.4 in there, and we want to take it to a 0.54 total. So we're going to add a 0.15 
which is the 20, to this. Hopefully that will get us in line for the forward gear and then we'll see what we need to adjust on the reverse. Always make sure before I put them in there, if you get too many shims laying around, sometimes that can be a bad thing. So, let's go back together and see where we end up. Hopefully this will be the last time we're putting the pinion gear together. All right, 103 coming up. About throwing out my back. Good stuff. All right, let's get our housing back in. Looking good. We're at point four oh. So we're in there, just barely, but we're in there because we had a range of point two one to point four four. I'm gonna go with that, especially because right now there's no fluid in there. And when I fill it up, it's gonna actually gonna close that gap a little bit more. So I'm I'm good with it being a, a little bit toward the loose side. So let's reconfigure it and see where we ended up on the reverse side. So, let's get our prop on. Get it snug down and we'll see where we ended up. All right, she's, she's way too loose. 1.45. So we're gonna use the different equation. So it's gonna be our measured, which is 1.45 minus the 0.87 times 0.71. So we need to change it by 0.41. So we are going to end up, 1.15 is what we had in there. So we want to end up somewhere around 1.56 total. So we're going to increase it by 0.4. So that should be pretty easy to find, uh, just a 0.4 and cram it in there, see where we end up. There we go. All right, the shim stayed in there, so we don't have to worry about that. Let's get this pulled apart, get that 0.4 in there, remeasure. All right, let's go. So let's step over to the press. We want to make sure that this bearing didn't get pulled up any. I'm going to push it back down just to make sure. Then I'm going to press this on. Then we'll see where we ended up. Yep, it, it shifted just slightly. So doing this was very important. Now let's get it in there. dead on 0.93 all right guys that's what we're looking for we want to go ahead and get off the measuring devices take off the prop and then you just want to feel the output shaft because I've actually measured these and it tells me I'm right in the ballpark and you couldn't even move the shaft it was just too tight although it was measuring as it should that may be the reason that Yamaha changed their measuring procedure on this particular model. But I've been doing this particular format for a long time and it's always served me pretty well. All right, that's with everything removed. 
Yeah, it's got a little bit of resistance to it, but nothing that I can't turn with my fingers. All right, guys, that pretty much wraps this one up. Only thing I have left to do now is uh, do a pressure test and fill it up with fluid. And actually, we have a couple of videos that show you how to do that. So if you need that information, why don't you reference those videos? Listen, if you need any parts for your boat, why don't you come see us at boats.net and we can get you taken care of. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below and I'll do my best to answer them. We just want to say thanks for shopping here with us at boats.net and we will see you in the next video. Have a great day.